going to start off by very briefly saying thank you on behalf of Mr. Seifa and his family um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is not lost on anybody in this courtroom that each and every one of you have lives outside of this courtroom. You have jobs and families and things that you could be doing other than being a juror in this case. Um, the second reason is, look, this is not a shop case. This is a homicide. The stakes don't get much higher than that. It is a serious case, and I know that you're going to take this seriously. For whatever it's worth, on behalf of Mr. Seif and his family, I say thank you for the time and attention. The other thing I want to say is just briefly comment on the attorneys in the case. This was, look, Ms. O'Neill and Mr. Sheehan, they are outstanding prosecutors. They are professionals, and they conducted themselves professionally in this case. Um, this was not a contentious case, not like on TV where lawyers are screaming at each other. I, I don't even think there were two or three objections to the trial. Um, what I do want to say at the outset is if at any point in the trial, uh, Rose McGride in the face asked a question, said anything that rubbed you the wrong way, I apologize. But please don't hold that against Mr. Sipa. Please don't take that out on me. This is a case about self-defense. And this was self-defense. And my hope is that by the time you are done reviewing the evidence, you will come to that exact same conclusion. I don't know what Ms. O'Neill is going to find. And I don't get to respond after she stands up and makes her own. The rules of this court don't let me do that. But I would imagine that part of her argument is going to focus on very graphic, horrific photographs in this case. You were shown photograph after photograph after photograph. And I hope that you were asking yourself, why? Why was I shown photograph after photograph, graphic, could the witness have described that to me instead of me being shown a photograph? Would one photograph have done the job instead of five photographs? Are these photographs being shown to you because they are evidential? Because they add to the evidence and proof in this case? Or are they being shown to you for some other reason? At the conclusion of the arguments, Judge Kaczynski is going to read you the law. You can think of these as rules for deliberation. And they are rules that when you were selected as jurors, you all said you would follow. And we take your work when you tell us that. We don't question you. This is what the judge is going to say verbatim. She's going to tell you that as jurors, it is your duty to weigh the evidence calmly and without passion, prejudice, or sympathy. Any influence caused by these emotions has the potential to deprive both the state and the defendant of what you promised them, a fair and impartial trial by fair and impartial jurors. Passion is not proof. Emotion is not evidence. And sympathy, I'm sorry, is not science. And your verdict has to be based on evidence, proof, and science. And while I'm talking about sympathy, let me get this out of the way right at the beginning. There is nobody in this courtroom who does not grieve. Virginia Murray suffered a horrible, horrific loss. It's okay to feel sympathy. That's human. But what I'm respectfully asking you, do not let sympathy cloud your judgment. You said you would be fair. I know you will be. The verdict can't be based on emotion. The judge is also going to say this. Speculation, conjecture, and other forms of guessing play no role in your performance of your work. That's the most important thing that the judge is going to say in this trial. 
because any guilty verdict is going to require you to do exactly that. Guess, speculate. That's the only way you can come to a guilty verdict. Because the proof points to self-defense. The judge is going to tell you that you must find Mr. Sipa guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. What is a reasonable doubt? A reasonable doubt is an honest and reasonable uncertainty in your minds about the guilt of the defendant after you have given full and impartial consideration to all the evidence. <clears throat> Not just the evidence the state focuses on. A reasonable doubt may arise from the evidence itself or from a lack of evidence. It is a doubt that a reasonable person hearing the same evidence would have. If Based on your consideration of the evidence, you are firmly convinced that the defendant is guilty of the crime charge, you must find him guilty. On the other hand, if you are not firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, you must give the defendant the benefit of the doubt and find him not guilty. A reasonable doubt is that pause. It's that hesitation. It's the question in your mind. And there's so much reasonable doubt. Remember when Mr. Rosenberg stood up in the opening and he told you about his first jury trial? And he talked to you about the judge during voir dire when they're doing jury selection and he starts kicking people off the jury who say, I don't know if the defendant's guilty or innocent until finally a woman says, no, he's innocent. You're still at that spot. He's presumed innocent and that follows him into the jury. The judge is going to say exactly this. The defendant on trial is presumed to be innocent and unless each and every essential element of the offense charged is proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant must be found not guilty of that charge. The burden of proving each element of a charge beyond a reasonable doubt rests upon the state. That is the government. And that burden never shifts to the defendant. And the defendant in a criminal case has no obligation or duty to prove his or her innocence or offer any proof relating to his or her innocence. Let me make a final point on that. I don't need to be standing here right now. We did not need to cross-examine any witnesses. We did not even need to offer any evidence. It all lies on the government. They have to do all the convincing and produce all the evidence that proves guilt. So where do we start? With those principles in mind, when you walk into that jury room and you start deliberating, what's the first thing? The first thing is Conrad Sipa is not guilty. That's where you start. Conrad Sipa acted in self-defense. That's your starting point in the deliberations. Has the government proven that Conrad Sipa was not acting in self-defense? And is that proof so compelling, so powerful, so concrete, that it overcomes any reasonable doubt? That's your starting point. I want to talk about self-defense because that is what this case is about. This is what the judge is going to tell you. The use of force upon or toward another person is justifiable, and the actor reasonably believes that such force is immediately necessary for the purpose of protecting himself against the use of unlawful force by such other person on the present occasion. When a person is in imminent danger of bodily harm, the person has a right to use force for even deadly force when that force is necessary to prevent the use against him or her of unlawful force. That's what happened here. The use of deadly force may be justified only to defend against force or the threat of force of nearly equal severity and is not justifiable unless the defendant reasonably believes that such force is necessary to protect himself or herself against death or serious bodily injury. That is self-defense. And I want you to keep those principles in mind as we talk about the evidence, step by step. The state has a burden. They have to come here and prove to you beyond any reasonable doubt that self-defense is not what happened here. 
you're going to have five options, essentially, with respect to the murder charge in this case. The first option is not guilty because Conrad Sita acted in self-defense, and that is that he was threatened with deadly force and he defended himself with deadly force. Murder, meaning that he purposely or knowingly caused the death or serious bodily injury resulting in death. There's a third thing they have to prove with the murder charge. They have to prove that it was not a lesser included offense called passion provocation manslaughter. What does that mean? It means that Conrad Siegel was provoked by Richard Duke and acted under a passion resulting from that provocation. He did not have the opportunity to cool off and did not cool off before causing death. They have to prove to you that didn't happen in order for it to be murder. Aggravated manslaughter, recklessly causing the death of Richard Duke, doing so under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life, and reckless manslaughter, that he caused the death of Richard Duke and did so recklessly. Let's get rid of murder and aggravated manslaughter right off the bat. I would submit to you there is no basis for a verdict in either of those categories. <coughs> Richard Duke is not the fact that it's the result of extraordinary circumstances. It's not the result of criminal intent by Conrad Sipa. That didn't happen. Conrad Sipa did not drive down to LBI to see his best friend, murder in his heart, death on his mind. And any argument to that is nonsense, absolute nonsense. Richard Duty became highly intoxicated. Richard Duty solely possessed a knife during his struggle. And Conrad Sipa defended himself. That's exactly what happened. They, they cannot disprove Richard Duty's initiation of a deadly weapon in the struggle and his provocation. They cannot disprove those to you. This is not murder. You should dismiss that charge right off the bat. And it's not aggravated manslaughter. Reckless conduct is a disregard of a risk. That didn't happen here. Conrad Sipa was defending himself. Literally fighting for his life. This is a reckless conduct. So let's put all this together. Before we talk about the evidence, where do you need to be before you vote guilty? If you go back and you collectively as a group and individually as a jury decide, I believe beyond a reasonable doubt that Conrad Sipa was acting in self-defense, then your verdict is not guilty. That's obvious. What if you go back there and you say, I think it's highly likely that Conrad Sipa was acting in self-defense. Then your verdict is not guilty. What if you're a little less convinced? What if you say, I just think, I think it's likely, I think it's more likely that he acted in self-defense than did act in self-defense. Then your verdict is not guilty. What about this? Go back into the jury room and you say, look, I honestly don't know. I just don't know. Not guilty. Let's take the stakes off a little. What if you say, I think it's possible Conrad Sipa was not acting in self-defense then. Not guilty, because possible isn't good. What if you say, I think it is highly probable, highly probable, that Conrad Sipa was acting in self or was not acting in self-defense. <coughs> Your verdict is not guilty. The only way you can come to a guilty verdict is if you climb this wall and say, I believe beyond any reasonable doubt that Conrad Sipa was not acting in self-defense. That's it. That's the only way that you can vote guilty. If you follow the law and Judge Kaczynski's instructions. I'm going to talk to you about what we believe are reasonable doubts in this case. You could disregard all of them and just say, you know, I think everything except for one of them was nonsense, but I do, I do believe that one is a reasonable doubt. And that's a not guilty verdict. The first
first one I want to talk about is John Garkowski. Just, just to refresh your memory, John Garkowski was the expert witness that was retained and called by the government to come and testify about crime scene reconstruction. Do you remember John Garkowski? I'm going to use a strong word to describe John Garkowski. And I hope you forgive me if I overstep. He's biased. And I say that with reason. He is often wrong, but he is never in doubt. He is absolutely certain about everything that came out of his mouth. You remember in the beginning I asked him, is there somewhat of a subjective element to crime scene reconstruction? You remember what he said? Nope. There's no subjective element to crime scene reconstruction. That statement tells you a lot about John Garkowski. Because it's ridiculous. Of course there's a subjective element to crime scene reconstruction. They're basing their opinion on objective scientific evidence. But their opinion depends on the subjective analysis of that evidence. So why is he on a witness stand, under oath, telling you that there's no subjective element to crime scene reconstruction? I said, well, let me ask the question a different way. Could two crime scene reconstruction experts come to different conclusions in analyzing the same case? You remember what he said? He said, no, couldn't happen. Those two statements give you a little insight into John Karkowski. He has always worked for law enforcement. He always testifies for the government. So when I say biased, if that's too cutting for you, I beg your pardon. But I think you get my point. If you remember, and I'm only going to point out two things here. Remember he said, well, I can tell, because I am a crime scene reconstruction expert, that the only way these handprints could have gone on the chair, because of the orientation is of someone standing in front of the chair. And on the witness stand, he said, well, it's possible they crossed each other. That's the only other way it could happen. You remember that? And then, in about 60 seconds, he says, well, yeah, I guess it's possible if you turned one way or the other, that could explain it. He says, I know, because I looked at this photograph, that that ceramic piece has to be stuck to the back of that chair by blood. I know that. Never examined it, but I know it. And of course, that's nonsense. There's a lip. We don't know if the ceramic had teeth to it that just stuck to the chair. We don't know any of that. Here's the point I'm making. John Karkowski says things with an awful lot of certainty that are uncertain. And here's where the reasonable doubt comes in. Even John Karkowski sat on that witness stand and was asked, is it possible Richard Doody is holding a knife up at his head during a struggle? Remember what he said? Yes. Yes. Not just that statement, but the fact that that statement came <coughs> from John Garkowski is incredible. That's reasonable doubt. Because that's the government's own expert witness conceding to you that he does not know if Richard Doody had a knife in his hand in a struggle. You could stop right there. You could find Conrad Siebel not guilty based on that testimony all along. But there's more. DNA. Reasonable doubt number two. So the state introduced two witnesses in conjunction with the DNA evidence. Ms. Lane and Ms. Concezzo. Serologist and the animal. They find
find blood on the blade of the knife. And they test it. And they say, that's Richard Doody's blood. Then they test the handle. Whose DNA is on that handle? Richard Doody. Is Conrad Sifa's DNA on that handle? No. They use epithelial DNA, skin cells, touch. And if you remember, Ms. O'Neill stood up after Mr. Ms. Nazezon testified on cross-examination. She said, well, what about wiping, wiping the blade off, right? And Ms. Nazezon, who I would submit is a very credible witness, an honest witness, gave a very honest answer. She said, yeah, except I wouldn't expect to find Richard Doody's DNA on that knife handle if it was wiped off. So what does Conrad see to do? Does he look at this knife handle and pick out these, this DNA that's visible to the naked eye and just actually wipe off where his DNA is and leave Richard Doody's DNA? No. It's impossible. So the state's coming to you, and they're arguing to you that Conrad Sitha had complete control over that knife. He's the one who committed the murder. He's the one who had access to it. He's the one who did it. And his DNA is not on the knife handle. Quick, tell me how that's possible. How is that possible? 